That last song certainly sets before us what is involved in being faithful to our Lord. That we must fight the fight of faith as Paul said he had done toward the end of his life. And to fight the fight of faith since faith comes by hearing the word of God and the term the faith stands for the whole New Testament system means then to fight according to the teachings of Christ in the New Testament. It means to defend the truth and whatever part of it is being attacked. We live in a world that is not friendly to Christianity. We live in a world that becomes more outright militant antagonistic against it. In times past in this nation due to the freedoms we've enjoyed in religion, that is to practice them freely without, as was said this morning in the prayer, fear of molestation, we have become accustomed and it's just the way we think. It is traditional with us that uh, one can teach and uh, believe what one would without the government or anybody else interfering, at least under the protection of the Constitution of the United States and the laws derived therefrom. But of course, whether we have those freedoms or whether we don't, and throughout history, at least since the time of the church being established, then there's been far more times that those protections were not there than there have been them being there. But we're expected of God to live faithful every day. We just sang a song that indicated that we're to put on the whole armor of God. It is set out in Ephesians chapter 6. And that we are, as I said earlier, to fight the fight of faith. Or as Jude said in June 3, to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. This morning I have in mind coming right down to individual actions in a given situation of which I'll mention in a moment. But let's also realize that we're going to have to stand before the judgment bar of Christ someday to give an account of what we've done in our lives. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 14, 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I suggest that we ought to meditate on that and realize the significance of it and how it should help us order our lives because there is that day when that shall be as even this day has come about and we are in the reality of where we are right now. It may sound like some sort of uh, fantasy movie, but it will be a reality just as real to us as we are experiencing things right now. We must give an account to God for the way we've lived. So let's keep that in mind. Now that's a general thing over all things, but I have in mind this morning a certain matter. And I'll get to it in a moment. Let us also remind ourselves that there are many situations and circumstances that arise in a Christian's life that call for decisions to be made. We must understand that. It's a part of being a child of God and being faithful to the Christ. Now some of these decisions are not as difficult as others. And the decisions we make may not be as far-reaching. But there are those decisions that are very serious. And they have long time and far-reaching blessings or consequences depending on the decision that we make. Because you see, we're living lives whereby we conduct ourselves a certain way. Remembering that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the only thing that can keep one out of heaven. And God, of course, through Christ, by the gospel, has ordained the way so that our sins can be forgiven. And all those who believe the gospel from the heart obeyed it. In repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in the Christ, the Son of God, and completing their obedience and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the forgiveness or remission of sins, then, of course, that person, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, verse 41, 42, and 47, becomes a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2. 
The Lord adding them to that church, verse 47. In that church, then because of our own decision to leave the ways of the world, to leave the way we want to live and live it as Christ in the New Testament teaches, then we start out on a new course. At our repentance before baptism, we have said, I become dead or separated from the ways of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life will no longer govern the way I think and cause me to make decisions. I will make decisions on the basis of the authority of my Lord who died for me, shed his blood for the remission of my sins, who is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body, which is the church. Colossians 1.18, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So faithful servants of God have always had to make difficult decisions. Sometimes I hear Christians saying, well, boy, this is terrible. Well, what do you expect? I mean, after all, we sang a moment ago, and it's based on a scripture, Jesus himself saying, take up your cross daily, every single solitary day, and do what? Follow me. Sometimes we sing a song also, there is a cross for me to bear. We sometimes forget that because I don't know to put it any other way in our nation, there hasn't been a whole lot to give up in the sense of serving God. That is things that would really um, oppose us in the, from the government, uh, things uh, where the culture was totally antagonistic to everything the New Testament teaches. But we're seeing that fast change. So we've always, if you're faithful to God and all that means, had to make uh, serious decisions. That's an integral part of being a Christian. It goes along with the territory. If you're thinking about being a Christian, as that word is defined and used in the New Testament, it goes along with the territory. Sacrifices are to be made. A sacrifice is giving up something that's important to you, that you enjoy, that you would like to keep, but for the sake of the Lord and according to His word as to how you live, you give it up. With that fact in mind, I want you to consider what is said in that great chapter about faithful worthies of old who never heard the gospel. And yet that's written there so that we'll be mindful of the fact that the faith that saves, whether it's the patriarchal dispensation or the mosaical dispensation or the Christian dispensation, has always been the faith that obeys. Christ is the author of eternal salvation. Unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. So we read in Hebrews 11... Verses 24 and 25. By faith, remember faith comes from hearing the word of God. So what this man's about to do is by the instructions of God and his word. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God. Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for season. Moses had to make a decision. And if you don't think it was a, a jolting decision, a life-changing decision, then you just don't know what the Bible says or else you don't believe it. He had to make that decision. Would he, number one, remain in the house of Pharaoh and someday possibly become Pharaoh himself, but certainly live a life of luxury as a great prince of Egypt? Or number two, would he choose to be with God's people and be a slave and an outcast for a certain period of time? Well, he made that decision, and the scripture plainly tells us he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God that enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, that's sometimes completely foreign to people in their false and twisted concept of Christianity because they've been persuaded by the wealth and happiness type people that if you serve God then there will be nothing ever happened to you that will be bad. If you had a dollar now you have a million and if you're on an acreage you'll get a thousand acres and everything will just be perfect according to this life's standard of what is perfect. But this was not so. He gave up wealth and power and fortune to suffer with the people of God. Now he did it by faith thus he knew the teaching of God's word if you please regarding the people of Israel and what they were and what God had chosen them to be. Well, as I look at this, that I know early in life, those young people and their parents who are determined, now watch it, at all costs to faithfully serve God, must learn to choose those courses of action. 
that are authorized by the teaching of Jesus Christ and his inspired New Testament. Often we quote it, but it still does not take away the importance of it and the power of it. Paul's writing in Colossians 3 and verse 17, Whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father. Now, that's the way it is if you accept the Bible to be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man, which it is, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The authority of our King, our Savior, He who gave His life for us, whose death we commemorated a while ago as an act of worship, all that means something as to how we think, what we do, how we view life, how we view our conduct. The question that I'm now getting to as to specifically what we're talking about is this. Should you attend and participate in the school prom? Should you? Is it Christian to do it? Is God happy with you when you do that? Well, this question that's serving as the title of my sermon today is raised because of one of those occasions when parents and their children must choose to participate in the high school prom or not to. And they need to know the why and wherefores of it. They need to approach it as any Christian, and all that word means New Testament, approaches anything. What does the Bible teach? What's God's will? I'm his servant. I'm not here to do as I please. I'm here to do as he pleases and with complete confidence that God knows better how for me to live my life than I do. For you see, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I cannot trust in my own intellect or the intellect of others alone without the guidance of God. The whole thing about Christians is, being that the word Christian means of Christ, is that I am to do what the Lord said. In order for right choices to be made, these parents and their children and all of us must understand what the Bible teaches on this important matter. It's a must. I realize everything else that's going on in the public schools and in our society and culture uh, probably surpasses even this as all the terrible things that go on that's destroying homes and Oh, it's just a mess. That's the only way you describe it. Because people will not return to belief in God and the Christ and His good gospel to form their views and to make their decisions on the basis of it. Let's just simply say, in other words, for many high school students and their parents, prom time is decision time. Now, what I'm going to say from God's good word, rightly divided, is not just applied to this one thing. These are general Biblical principles that should be in the mind of every faithful child of God as they view any and all things that they can truly know what they ought to be doing and ought not be doing. So it's decision time, and this is the time of year when such things start taking place. And may it be said, too, that uh, they should not, these parents and children, wait till the time for the prom to take place before they begin their study of this matter. Because what we're studying, as I said a moment ago, has to do with general Christian living. I'm just applying it to this one particular situation, which should be self-evident to all as to why we would. The problem with the prom, primarily, fundamentally, and yes, I know there are other things involved too, but the problem with the prom is it's primarily a dance. In the dictionary, a prom is simply defined as a, quote, formal college or school ball or dance, unquote. Now, I'm not talking about the Scottish sword dance. I see nothing in that, and so far as I can tell, that causes any kind of um, mood to be created that would be filled with lust. I'm not talking about when your team at the football game or basketball has made points and you jump up and down and holler hoopy and all of that. You know, that's a dance too. And we commonly don't recognize some things that could be called a dance. 
I'm talking about what is commonly called a dance on the dance floor that goes through every kind of bodily gyration and rubbing on one another and everything else. I'm talking about that kind of thing. And simply for you to ask the question, is that what the New Testament says I ought to do to show forth my godliness? Almost to ask that question, uh, one should answer it. So the prom is an occasion that calls for God's people to choose whether to participate in the dance or not to do so. To make the correct decision, you're going to have to develop the faith that you see written of in Moses. And you're going to have to develop on the basis of your confidence in God's good word that he knows how you to live and to get you from earth to heaven, the courage that Moses had to make those decisions. The courage of one's convictions. The Bible does provide the information that will guide us in making the right decision. You know, we may not know all the problems that arrive, but let me tell you something. The infallible Word of God has anticipated every one of those problems, and the solution to that problem is found in the Bible. God expects us to have enough concern and so bride of mind and desire to serve him on this earth that we will learn how to study the Bible, that is, how to rightly divide the word of truth, have enough respect for the word of God that we will receive it with meekness. That is, the disposition of mind recognizing what it is. That it's the will of heaven and we have said we will live to serve God. That's our life. Because this life's not all of it. We're getting ready for our long home. And between us and that, we must stand before the judgment bar of God to give an account, every one of us, of the deeds done in the body. And John 12, 48 says that standard of conduct for us is the Bible, specifically the New Testament, the last will and testament of Christ. He that rejecteth me, Jesus said, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. There won't be any dodging. There won't be any slipping around. There won't be any late for class. Each one of us all by ourselves will stand there before Jesus who died for us, gave his life for us, gave us the way to heaven in the words of the New Testament, and we'll give an account of how we conducted ourselves and however much time we spent on this earth. So we want to see what the Bible teaches about these things. There's information in the Bible to guide us and direct us if we'll do what's necessary because we have a deep concern to please God, to study it and learn it. Remembering again that it's designed to give us righteousness. That is the information pertaining how to live to be well-pleasing to God. So we want to see what the Bible teaches about, number one, the term lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. And the next point, two major points in the lesson, our own personal influence on other people. Now, lasciviousness is a word you don't hear used a lot today. And that must mean that it doesn't exist anymore, or the thought that's in it, the idea that's there just is not around. Well, you don't hear fornication used a lot today either, but I assure you, it's still around. You don't hear the word adultery used very much. A lot of things like that. In fact, about the only time you hear sin used, and mock it, make light of it. But that doesn't change what the Bible teaches and our need to understand it and let those truths guide our thinking, our lives. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5, we'll start reading in verse 19 and go through verse 21. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul's writing. He's writing to the churches of Galatia. He's headed toward the end of the letter. Here's a letter not written to just one church or an individual, but to churches and several churches in a given area called Galatia. These people have heard, believed, and from the heart obeyed the gospel. The Lord's added them to the church. They wear the name Christian, but they're in need of, of being instructed, reminded, reproved, rebuked, and exhorted to make sure they live the truth. So if they needed it, we need it, and we always will need it, that we can remain faithful and heaven will be our home. And the quicker we learn that the better off we'll be. Paul wrote, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. That is, they're made known. They're revealed. You can know it. He says, Here they are. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, 
uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, ending, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now watch what he says. This is not new to use what he's saying. You've already been instructed in this because he says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. You know, that means Paul at least preached a sermon twice. If it's worth preaching the first time, it's worth preaching as many times as it needs preaching. He says, what have I told you in time past, as I'm telling you now, that they which do such things, that's action, to do is action, those who are engaged in such actions, what actions? This whole list up here, and all that it means, all that it implies. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't say this to people out in the world. He said it to people who knew what the church was, the kingdom was, who knew that they were dedicated to Christ and they were to be living like the head of the church, Christ, their Savior, has taught them in his testament to live. If you do these things, you lose your soul. That's not hard to understand. Another question that must come up here, do you really believe it? Do you really believe if you're engaging these things? Well, I want us to zero in, not on all of them, but as I said, on the word lasciviousness. Lasciviousness will send you to hell. Lasciviousness keeps you out of heaven. You cannot engage in what is lascivious and have God blessing you and saying on the day of judgment when you stand before him to give an account of the deeds done in the body, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You'll lose your soul if you're involved. Now lasciviousness is defined as wanton acts or manners, filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. Now you look at about any Greek lexicon and see this. This is basically Thayer's Greek English lexicon that gives us this definition. But let me say it again. What is lasciviousness? Wanton acts or manners. That is, anything that comes to mind, you do it without any control, any guidance. It's just what you want to do. And as the stupid hippie said back when I was young, if it feels good, do it. Anybody that still believes that is in the same boat. Filthy words. Yeah, they're words. They're good words. They're wholesome words, but they're filthy words too. If you engage in cussing, and I use the word cussing rather than cursing. Cursing sometimes is pronounce a curse on somebody. May the bird of paradise fly up your nose or something like that. Uh, but cussing is just downright dirty language. You do that, you go to hell. I don't know why people can't understand that. It's that plain. That's what he's saying. That's why it's written. Words have meanings. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said, and this will stand there meaning what he said on the day of judgment, and we'll give an account of the deeds of the gun. Now, when you have lived your life using foul language and telling dirty jokes and engaging in, in wanton acts or manners, and you stand before him judgment, you're going to have to realize he has prohibited that, and that's how you're going to be judged. He won't change the standard of judgment. So, we need to understand that. Now, such conduct as we've seen, wanton acts or manners, filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females, that's lasciviousness, such conduct gives dancing its sex appeal. I wouldn't take the time to do this, but when you're watching any kind of television advertisements, it doesn't make any difference. I don't know that you can write fast enough to do this, you want to take notes. But try to notice how many times sex appeal is used. And if you add to it the times they don't just use the term sex appeal or words that say the same thing, but then how they uh, do in their dressing, well, well everything around us is said uh, sex appeal. Clothing, attitudes, everything. But God reserves sex appeal for marriage. I'm sorry the world doesn't believe it, but when they stand before God in judgment, they'll say, you practice this which was reserved for marriage when it comes to sex appeal outside of marriage, you're lost. 
That's putting it blunt, but that's exactly what's going on. When questioning whether or not to go to a dance, and you've heard me define the word dance, and lasciviousness tells you what is considered basically the kind of dances that are out there that everybody enjoys. And I do have a problem with those who wear the name Christian really enjoying, what is that contest stuff, what do they call it, where everybody's jumping around with very little on, and they're all seeing who wins. It's amazing at those who wear the precious name of their Lord and Savior, knowing his will says this, and they get ready for it, and they're discussing who's going to win tonight. Something wrong there, folks. Something bad wrong. But that's the way our world is, and the world's never been encouraging to live according to the truth. The world encourages lasciviousness. Who are you to judge me? I mentioned earlier in class about watching this debate with the late Christopher uh, Hitchens, an atheist, several times, and he said, I feel like my life has been fulfilled when I'm able to get people to live as free as I live and people not tell me I have to live my life. Well, of course, he's saying that in the standpoint of people like me who preach the Word of God, which Word of God says this is the way you must live. You can choose to live contrary to the Word of God, fine. You have that power in this life, but you lose your soul when you do. You know, that's the obligation of preachers to do that. I'm sorry there are those preachers who, I think, hypocritically wear the name gospel preacher when they will not preach plainly and to the point on specific matters. It's easy to stand up there and say, if you commit sin, you'll lose your soul. And folks right in the middle of certain sins will say, that's right. But you know, the rub comes when you say, we're talking about going to the prom. We're talking about modern dancing. We're talking about you making these decisions. Then you quit preaching going to meddling. So let's meddle some more. So when questioning whether or not to go to a dance, I, I want you to think of these three questions. And you should ask yourself these. Can you control your thoughts so that you will not lust? That you will keep your mind where God says your mind ought to be? Can you control the thoughts of the person you're dancing with and be sure that that person is not lusting after you? Or somebody else for that matter, just not lusting. Can you control the thoughts of those who may be watching, and I may say here who are watching. Uh, after all, if they don't watch, why are they making multiplied millions of dollars on Monday night? People by the jillions are watching all that stuff and talking about it the next day on television. Can you control the thoughts of those who may be watching you and be sure that they're not lusting? Well, I'll add one to that, and this would really settle it for the faithful child of God and all that that means. Does the Bible authorize you to engage in that action? That's the simplest thing in the world to determine what's right and wrong. Does my Lord, who died for me, who knows how to live life, who came and lived it for me, to show me how to live, does he in his last will and testament, by the meaning of words and sentences, authorize me to... To act this way. You ever told your children or had your parents in rear and you say, you were never taught to act that way. Well, brethren, on the day of judgment, when you give an account of your deeds to the Lord, he could easily say that when he opens up the New Testament at any point and says, you were never taught to act that way. And he'll be right. So if the answer, by the way, this just makes us think on these three questions, to any of these is no... Or, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, then you shouldn't be involved in such activities, whether it's a dance or anything else, that allows for, to be labeled properly, lasciviousness. Why in the world would a child of God want to dibble and dabble in that? Remember, I said in the beginning, sin is the only thing to keep you out of heaven. Sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. It's leaving undone what he says we ought to do, sins of omission, James 4, 17. To die guilty of any of those means, depart from me. Wicked and everlasting fires prepared to his devil and his angel. Well, the idea of heaven and hell itself is, is politically incorrect nowadays. If you don't believe it, just read what our president said his concept of heaven and hell is. Now, do you honestly think there's a person alive who could answer all three of these questions in the affirmative? Yes. Can you control your thoughts so that you will not lust in that kind of environment? And you say, yes, I can do that, especially if you're 16 years old. Can you control the thoughts of the person you're dancing with and be sure they're not lusting? Yes, I can do that. 
You really believe that? Can you control the thoughts of those who are watching you and be sure they're not lusting? And it's part of a, being a Christian to live such ways to cause people to lust. Now you say, well, people are going to lust anyway. Yeah, but are you going to be a part of causing it to be that way? That's my responsibility. I have to live my life so that somebody says, well, he caused me to lust. The Lord can say, no, he didn't. He was living right. That's your problem. Let it be to where it's their problem. And we didn't encourage it. Why in the world should a child of God who's the light of the world, who's the salt of the earth, who is the leavening for good as the Bible defines the good, should ever be able to be successfully charged with encouraging people to do wrong? One may think that he's able to control his thoughts that he has in those environments. But you're going into a situation, the design of which is to create those thoughts and those appetites and to encourage them. I mean, you know, if, if, you, if you don't want to play baseball, don't become a member of the team. Aren't we smart enough? Is that, is that dumbing it down enough for a lot who just can't see a problem here? And I mean that kindly, but that's terminology that everybody uses to say, have you got it? Also, there's no way to control the thoughts of others, and if we cause others to sin, then we're partly responsible for it. So again, we live lies so that when they charge us with saying, well, you caused me to do that, it won't stick. It's not true. They can't prove it. In fact, we were living lies right the opposite. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 and 7. Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. Now listen. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Thus I can be a person who can live my life in such a way as to aid people and abet people in their transgressing of God's law, or I can live my life in such a way that provides no encouragement to them at all. In fact, it rebukes that kind of life by the way that I live. If not, you tell me what a good example is when it comes to the Bible teaching on a good example that comes from Christian living. That's important. That I don't think these are, are difficult things to understand. I think then we can see the severity of acting in such a way that encourages, aids, and abets another person in sinning. Christians should not be the ones to feel peer pressure. I, I know about all of that. Uh, I realize younger people sometimes think, well, you're 65. How do you know anything about what it was being young? Well, well may I remind you, I've been where you've been. You haven't been where I've been. And all of us old heads have been back there to when all the hormones were raging. And after all, don't talk to me. I grew up in the 60s. You don't know a thing about anything. I was over one time attending a class I lived in awesome at the University of Texas. And this would have been, oh, in the late 80s. And they were trying to have some sort of demonstration like was done regularly and in big time way in the 60s. And it was just my way of demonstration for what I'd witnessed in the 60s. It was pitiful. <laughs> and I turned to a fellow standing there, because I was standing there looking at it, and I looked at him and I said, you know, if this is supposed to be a demonstration, he said, they, they, I, I said, they missed the boat a long time ago on how to do it, if this is supposed to accomplish much of anything. The guy just kind of looked at me, kind of funny, but I've been there, folks. I haven't participated in that mess. You know, I, at, at 16 and 17, right where some of you are now, I oppose that mess then as much as I do at 65. So I believe, you'd find out I was a very old 18 if you were hearing me preach when I was 18, 19, 20. You'd think that, oh, I preach the same thing I preach now. Well, that's the nature of truth. It's the nature of truth. It's just the way it is. And so don't think, well, you don't know what we're talking about. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about and a whole lot more than you do. Oh, well, you're proud. No, I've just been where you haven't been, lived a lot longer living like the Bible said. I know wherever I speak and so do a lot of other brethren. You remember it was Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, 
who messed up the whole kingdom because he listened to the young counselors rather than the older counselors. And the Bible is specific in saying that's why he messed it up. He was a stupid person. Don't be real boy when it comes to your life. You have that power over you. You can choose to follow the will of God, have the world frown on you, or you can choose to go with the world and have God frown on you. It's your choice. I recommend the first rather than the last. We're to be leaders of men. We're not to be under pressure. We're to, by what we teach and how we live, put other folks under pressure. I don't know why we have to go on the defensive. I've really never learned why Christians must go on the defensive. When you're out there where the world's working, and that's outside this building, <laughs> uh, put them on notice. I've been there too. Y'all know that you have, but I've been there. I changed at a state school. My roommate, who was several years older than me at the time, already been through the Navy and cussed like a sailor. Truly, not just simply, he did. And I got tired of hearing my Lord's name used in vain. So I said, next time you do that, I'm gone. I don't believe it. You can do what you want to about it. It's wrong, but I'm not going to jump on you about it. You're bigger than I am anyway and older. But I said, I'm telling you, I'm not going to put up with it. Well, he came in one day out of English class. He was an English major. And uh, he was mad about the teacher, and here he went. I said, fine. There was a boy down the hall whose roommate was leaving who grew up in my mama's hometown who was a member of the church. I walked down there. I said, Do you, would you let me room with you? He said, be glad to have you. I walked back down there, and in five minutes, I said, I told you what I'd do last time. I'm going now. Be out in a few minutes. He just sort of dropped his jaw. Put them on the spot. I'm a Christian. I'm a child of the living God, a soldier of the cross. I have no reason to be under pressure. And you say, well, you're bragging. No, I'm not. I'm trying to say, you can do the same thing if you will. Well, some of you young people, why, why don't you say to some of these folks that want to go to something, why in the world do you want to go to such a silly thing as that? Look at you out there on the floor. You look like a bunch of drunk monkeys. <laughs> well, that's the thing to do. Well, you can go to the zoo and see that, but at least they're behind bars. Christians are to be the light, and light vanishes darkness. Always has. Darkness cannot exist where there's light. I think I told you another time, or at least some of you I have, in that same dorm, <laughs> I got to know some of the fellows down the hall. They're a couple of years older than me. They knew I preached. So one day I come in in class, and they had taken a cardboard back out of a shirt to send to the cleaners, and they had written, Preacher, put Elmer's glue on the back of it and stuck it in my door. And they, I could hear them down there. But I heard nothing, which meant they were listening for me in my reaction. So I went down there after I put my books in, and I said, uh, you know, you don't know all the time as a child of God how you're living and the impact you're having on people. And I said, but what you put on my door, I appreciate the encouragement. I never touched it, but some way it disappeared. <laughs> I wish I could always think that way. I haven't always been able to think that fast. But I'm telling you, I did that when I was 17 years old in state school. Same room where I was one night and got to lock the door and a kid busted the door. I don't know who the world it was. Never saw him before or since. But he's trying to give me a big swig out of his bottle of whiskey. Well, I, of course, got up and drank half of it went to sleep. No, I didn't. I told him to get out or there'd be somebody else called that would put him out. Now, he was gone. Rather than stand up for what's right, Jesus died for you. He suffered on a cross nailed to it for you so you can have forgiveness of sins. Learn as a young person to stand up. Why go with the crowd? I learned that a long time ago, and thanks be to God I did. I just wish I was even better at it. I got tired of being around young people when I was a teenager who just mouthed around, didn't know their Bible from a comic book, and I got tired of that. Get tired of it in your life. You can't go to heaven any other way. You're not trying to whip sin with a feather duster. It won't work. Or a butter paddle or whatever it is. Now, I got myself in trouble pretty good the summer after I got out of high school. On Wednesday night, I was in the high school class because we hadn't moved up to the college class. And sat down. Here are my peers in the church. And this young man comes in who worked for a certain grocery store in town. And the manager of it was a member of another congregation. And I'm sitting there waiting for class, and this guy comes in growling about things. And I overhear, of course, we're right there together. I overhear him say something to the effect of, well, he said if I didn't repent of whatever it was, uh, he was going to fire me from the store. 
Well, you know, I didn't know a lot, but I knew that uh, that's not the motivation you need to get the person to biblically repent. It ought to be repentance because you sinned against God and you know it. And it's cutting you to the heart that you sinned against your Lord. And godly sorrow works that repentance, not you're going to lose your job. You might as well say, I'll baptize you to become a Christian or I'll fire you if you don't. You know, that won't work. It's wrong motivation, wrong reason to obey the gospel. So I said, let me ask something. Are you saying that this brother so-and-so uh, as an elder in the church and another congregation said that if you didn't go before the church here and make confession of fault, that he would fire you? He said, yes, sir, he did. He was muttering about it. Well, you know, I just didn't have any better sense than to go to the elders and tell them about it. I thought that's what I was supposed to do, and I still believe it, and I'd do it again. Seventeen years old, fresh out of high school, graduated a couple of months before. Well, I upset the child's uh, mother. I went to a gospel meeting during that week at the other congregation. The fellow who threatened to fire him came and got all over my case. Next thing I know, the elders were meeting. Daddy wasn't elder then. The elders were meeting. I was there. Daddy was there. All because of that. And... That's right. He did tell him that. When push came to shove, that's exactly what he said. Brethren, stand up and be counted. Do you understand now why at my age I get so sick of brethren who will not stand up and say things? I started that when I was a teenager, and I'm quitting, not going to quit. It's the right way to go. The Bible teaches it, and it will condone it on the day of judgment. So if you're talking about people and what they do and kids and getting themselves messed up and things, don't tell me. I don't know. I've been there, done that, and felt the prick. And a lot more than that, I'm telling you. I even was at Hardy. And lo and behold, there were people on our floor that I'd gone. You know what the wing ding is, buddy? That's the person that's over that, that floor. At least it was there. I tried to get this stopped. Nothing going on. You know, there's supposed to be people here, Christians, run by the Bible and all this stuff. Nothing was happening. No. Well, I didn't have any better sense than to bypass everybody. Got a appointment with President Gaines and sat down and talked to it. Well, boy, when it came back down the channels, there was every kind of meeting. And guess who was told that's not the way you handle things? You're looking at it. But it hadn't stopped me. It's not going to stop me. I don't care a thing about that. And if you want to see something that gets me to be more determined than ever to do what's right when I know it's right and know that I know it, just try to stop it. I can't see any other way to live because of what I read in my Bible and the actions of faithful people and the example they hold for us. Light banishes darkness. There's no pressure on light. You ever try to put light under pressure? <laughs> it will work. It dispels darkness. By the good example of Christians and their conduct, then pressure ought to be brought to bear on those people who are going to the dances instead of the Christian who will not go to them. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to, to suffer persecution. But I always felt like if they start trying to make me suffer, I have the power, scripturally now, to put some pressure back on them. And that I will do and have done and have for 45 years or more, and I'm not going to stop. In Exodus 23, 2, I learned something. I learned that it teaches that we should not be followers, but we should be leaders. Listen, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Now, what's hard about that? It's easier to follow a whole bunch of folks when they're doing evil. That's what it's saying, so don't do it. It won't justify you because you do it. Do what's right. I don't care whether you're David all by himself standing before Goliath you got God on your side, and that makes the majority. So we see from this that we're not to do something just because everybody else does it, or it's the end thing, or it's the way society's going. We're to set the proper standard of conduct before those round about us who are not living according to God's word. That's our obligation. That's what any Christian really wants to do and tries to do. Thus we see the importance of one's influence over other people. That word influence is by my example, the way I act, does it cause people to see good and want them to do good? Or by my example, the way I act, it encourages people to do bad. That's influence. It's either influence for good or bad. The matter of personal influence should be very important to every one of us. And we shouldn't have to wait till everybody else is doing it before we do it when it's right. 
I want to ask you, how big a crowd is going to be standing with you, holding your hand, defending you, when you stand before Jesus Christ's judgment bar to give an account of the deeds done to the body? And if the whole crowd is, what good is it going to do? In considering dancing, there are several things to think about in terms of what the effect would be on other people. The first point to consider is what would be the effect on the non-Christian. Besides it not being authorized, well, what's the effect on it? And that'd be true of anything when you're sinning and your actions show forth sin. When non-Christians see some Christians dancing and others taking the stand of not dancing, what message is that sending? All they're going to see is a double standard. And they'll not see any difference in our standard and the standard of the world with its error and confusion. The second point to consider is what would my influence be on other Christians? Not on the world, but on other Christians. If I go to the dance, I may influence others to go, causing them to be weaker than even I am and fall away from Christ. We've seen what God thinks of those who cause others to fall away. And thirdly, what would be the influence on the church? Because some may go dancing and others not, the world may view the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a whole host of hypocrites, which may directly or indirectly keep them from learning what is right and being saved. Now, we'll justify them in the long run. They ought to be able to learn the truth regardless of how we live. But we are providing the occasion by our bad influence for them to choose the wrong way. We've already studied that. I, finally, I'll just simply lose the power of setting a biblical example in my personal conduct if I attend dances such as the prom or any other endeavor that encourages and practices and is involved with lasciviousness or any other thing on this list. That list is in the Bible so you can read it, understand it, and say, I will not do it. I wouldn't do it because I'm a Christian. It's not the way I do those things. How can we expect someone to listen to us concerning the importance of becoming a Christian and serving God if we're not living our lives the way we should? 1 Thessalonians 5.22, Paul said to the church in Thessalonica, abstain from all appearance of evil. That means when evil appears, I abstain from it, regardless of the evil, when it appears, when it makes itself known, I see it, which means I have to know the Bible well enough to see that it's contrary to the Bible, thus it's evil, and what do I do? I abstain from it. I get away from it. I run from it. Christians should abstain from all forms, all fashions, and all kinds of evil. Why should they want to dibble-dabble in it? Except that they still have a lot of the world in them. They enjoy the lust of the flesh. They haven't put it to death and separated it from it. They like it. It feels good. It's pleasurable. We should not give Satan any opportunity to cast a shadow of doubt on our character. Christians ought to be willing to give up some things, whatever it might be, in order to be very sure that nobody will get the wrong idea about what we believe and what we practice. Is there still the business to take up your cross daily and follow me? Attending the prom and other dances show that, that we, well, we'll just flirt and compromise with evil rather than running from it, fleeing from it, abstaining from it. Now, in conclusion, let us remember again the great and marvelous, courageous faith of Moses. Listen, by faith Moses, he made a decision when he uh, was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Can you imagine the people that would love to have been the son of Pharaoh's daughter? But he chose otherwise. Here's what he did choose. Rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. They didn't last, folks. It just doesn't last. To follow Christ, then we must fight the temptations of the world. When our faith in God demands it, we must not be afraid to be different. I'm not saying being different for the sake of being different. I mean when our faith, the Word of God, how we're to live before God, to live righteously, to live faithful, means that we're different from everybody else, then we're going to be different because we will do God's will and the way He said do it and for the reason He said do it. We must let our light shine no matter what the cost to us. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, 16, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt is lost, his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing. Are you a good for nothing Christian? It's thenceforth good for nothing. But to be cast out, are you worthy of being cast out? And to be trodden underfoot, to be walked on by other men? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. 
and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Now watch the conclusion. Not hard. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what's the point of that? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. How do we get people to know we're serious about being godly? It's how we live. It's the actions in our daily lives done before others. It's that simple. So it's clear that Christ would not participate with worldly people in their dances or anything that would come under the heading of lasciviousness. These dances that have all this kind of sexual appeal. And he certainly doesn't authorize Christians to do it either. It's that simple. We may therefore conclude that it is a sin for Christians to participate in activities that violate the biblical principles of Christian conduct that we have studied in the Bible in this sermon. And of course, that's the standard by which you would have all men live, the standard set out in the New Testament. But we've obeyed the gospel. We have recognized our sins and lost condition and need of Christ to save us through the gospel. We have repented in the steps of the plan of salvation, which means we become dead or separated from the practice of sin, and we no longer want to do it. So it seems rather ridiculous somebody in the church, young or old, who's trying to figure out a way to dibble and dabble in that which is lasciviousness and condemned and those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's in your Bible. If you'd never heard of me, Paul would still be saying, if you do this, you're not going to heaven. Now, if you love the Lord, you'll keep his commandments. If you don't love him, you won't. It's that simple. It's always been that simple. I learned that when I was a teenager. And I haven't seen any reason to give it up. And don't intend to. Hope I'm wiser sometimes. But you know my wisdom has never said. Let sin go. And ignore it. And never say what ought to be said. In such a way. As whether they agree with you or not. They do understand what you mean. If you study what to do to become a Christian. I'd urge you to become one this morning. Because you have no hope that you'll be able even to see this afternoon. Today's the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. The child of God let me ask you. Have you been letting your light shine. So that people see Christ living in you. Or have you dibble dabbled in lasciviousness? Have you brought reproach on the blood bought body of Christ? Your brothers and sisters, your family who's Christian, have you lived in such a way that you brought reproach on the church? You need to repent of that. Come confessing it. We'll pray with you and for you. And God stands ready to forgive when you comply with His will from the heart. So if you're subject to His invitation, we beg, we plead with you to come while we stand and sing.